Mild alert. Uh, today is the fourth in a series of events that we've been putting on uh, in connection with the 30th anniversary of the accident just up the road in Middletown. Um, the big thing we ask is, you know, why are we commemorating an accident 30 years later? And it's so we can learn from it and make sure that what happened then doesn't happen again today. Um, today might be one of the most important events that we've sponsored because this deals with the actual health effects. This is what happens, you know, to people when, you know, depending on where you go or what you think with the radiation. And this is the essence of nuclear power. This is the real risk and reward with nuclear power is in the very unlikely event that there is a radioactive leak. What do you do about it? How do you control it? How do you measure it? And how do you uh, follow up the long-term health effects? Um, today we're going to have two speakers. We're going to have Arnie Gunnarsson, who has a bachelor's and master's degree from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in nuclear engineering. And he's going to go over um, the dosage and the radioactive release. Uh, he was one of the uh, few expert witnesses that was certified during the uh, litigation that was not thrown out by Judge Rambo. Uh, and he was in the industry for 17 years, or longer actually. Yeah, the industry executive. Uh, followed by him will be uh, Dr. Steve Wing from the University of North Carolina School of Public Health. Uh, he's, I dare say, a world-renowned expert in the uh, follow up and tracking of radiation and the epidemiology that goes with that. So we're going to have these two gentlemen talk and then we're going to take some questions. We're going to start off with Arnie. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me at the back? Okay. Uh, if you, if I tend to drop my voice, wave at me or something. Thank you. Um, I'm Arnie Gunderson and uh, your, your promotional information may have the, my name is spelled as S E N. <laughs> and some of the some of the stuff is S O N. So if you're if you're into correcting that kind of stuff, it is S E N. A um, couple things. I was uh, on the industry side of this argument until about 1992. I um, I had people reporting to me at Three Mile Island during the recovery. I had a TMI shirt that said I survived Three Mile Island, and um, I was on television saying that uh, um, I think I said the Titanic hit the iceberg and the iceberg sunk. Um, so I was clearly uh, of the opinion that this was a non-event. Until about 1992, I started looking into it and was asked to be an expert at the, uh, at the trial in 94 and um, really had a chance to dig into it then. My opinions have, have essentially gone 180 degrees. It's, it's, a, it's a significant event that we need to learn from if, uh, uh, if we're to have a new generation of nuclear plants which is sort of the direction I'm taking this. And then the other thing is that um, from a health effect, we better understand what happened here and, and with Dr. Wing's data, if we, um, uh, if we can learn from it as well. So uh, there's, there's two issues. What happened in the past to the, uh, to the people who uh, may have been exposed here in, in Harrisburg and Middletown? And then also looking forward, what have we learned from TMI? And that's what I'll, what I'll be talking about. Um, one last thing, uh, Dr. Wing and I have never met until today. Um, uh, it's interesting, I had this, these dose release, not dose, uh, Curie release numbers uh, for years, and as it turns out, it, it, uh, they were dramatically different than what the Nuclear Regulatory Commission says. So I, um, uh, I've been talking and talking, and finally I realized that Dr. Wing's epidemiological data which this release data supports, but we've never met, and uh, uh, I wouldn't have known him until today. So, okay, um, the, the title is Three Myths. There are more than three myths, but these are the three I decided to cover in my, in my 20 minutes. Uh, should an evacuation have been ordered? Did the containment leak? And how much radiation was really released? Like I said, there's more, uh, there are more myths, but uh, given 20 minutes, this will be a, <coughs> this will be a rush. So, should an evacuation have been ordered is the, uh, is the first thing. And I break that into two, uh, three segments. I break it into before 7 o'clock, what information was known to the people at Three Mile Island before 7, 7.30, 8 in the morning, and then around 10, and then around 2 on the first day. Uh, and I'll, I'll uh, talk to that. So, before, around 7 o'clock in the morning, an engineer and his supervisor, using an approved procedure, calculated that the uh, exposure in, Goldberg, in, in Goldsboro might be as high as 10 R an hour. Now, 
it was an approved procedure, and people have worked on it for years, and it was actually a TMI Unit 1 procedure. So this is not a, a new procedure. And by the procedure, an evacuation was required. There's no doubt that by the, the written process that people not in a crisis situation had available to them, by 7, 7.30 in the morning, a, um, an evacuation was required. At 7.30, TMI called the state and told them they had 10 R an hour, but they said that it seemed too conservative. And one of the things they said is that the pressure inside the containment wasn't as high as they had expected. Um, but the state was aware that calculations showed 10 R an hour. And um, uh, TMI's position was that it seemed too conservative. They said that um, they said the pressure wasn't high enough. Well, within the calculation, there was no pressure dependency. So um, basically, they went outside the realm in a, in a crisis situation as opposed to letting, uh, letting the procedure govern how you should be working your way through. Um, what they did not tell the state in that 7.30 phone call is that employees working outside had already begun to receive exposures. There's, uh, there's at least one case of an, ex of an exposure of 20 mil around to an, exp uh, an employee who was out on the grounds before 7.30 in the morning. They did not tell the state that already almost every radiation detector in the plant was off scale. And they did say that a helicopter flew to Goldsboro at about 7.30 in the morning and, uh, and found no radiation. Now there's two problems with that. First off, the, the, uh, actually there's three problems with that. The uh, plume, was, it was a very uh, calm day. And they'll, they'll admit that the helicopter actually got to Goldsboro before the plume would have gotten to Goldsboro. So had there been radiation coming, it would not have gotten there, and so based on that, they, they said, well, there's no radiation in Goldsboro. That's problem number one. Problem number two was that the plume, and I'm going to use my pointer at the back of the room. Let's say the plume, um, the center line of the plume was right in that corner. Is that working? No, it's not picking up. Okay, let's say the center line of the plume was right there. In Goldsboro, if they were off by six degrees, in other words, if they weren't right on the center line of the plume, they could have been off by a factor of 10,000 in the dose they recorded. It's something called a chi over q, it's a dispersion coefficient, and the plume would have been narrowly concentrated, and a 600 degree position error where they put the instrument would have resulted in as much as a 10,000 fold difference in radiation that they measured. So that's problem number two. Uh, it's very hard to chase a plume. And problem number three is that the helicopter actually arrived on site at 8.30. There was no helicopter at 7.30. So my belief is that at 7.30, procedures told them they should have evacuated. And in a situation like this, you don't, tr you don't try to change the rules on the fly. The next time I suggest would be a, a good time to have evacuated is around 8, 10 o'clock in the morning, between 10 and 11. By then, they knew that core thermocouples, that's a device to measure temperature inside the core, were measuring 2100 degrees. Well, normally they measure about 500 degrees. And 2100 degrees indicates that um, the, the control, the fuel rods are entering something called a zerk water reaction. Fuel rods are made of zirconium and they scavenge oxygen out of H2O. So the oxygen gets pulled out of the H2O, releasing hydrogen. So by 10 o'clock in the morning, they knew that there was hydrogen being generated. That should have surprised no one. In the hot leg from the reactor, that's the leg that would normally carry the hot water out of the reactor, the thermocouples were reading in excess of 700 degrees. Now, given the pressure that the reactor is capable of withstanding, they, it could not have been water at 700 degrees because the relief valves would have either opened or the vessel would have cracked. So that tells me that there was air, hot air, running through the hot leg at 
700 degrees, being already heated by the core. Another indication that the, uh, there was not enough cooling or no cooling going through the core. Also, by 10 o'clock, um, they had reactive cooling pumps, which are massive, uh, three, four thousand horsepower pumps. And the uh, amperage for those pumps was very low. And that's an indication that they're not pumping water, it's an indication they're pumping steam or air. And the next thing is that in a, in a pressurized water reactor, they have neutron monitors in the core, but they have neutron monitors outside of the nuclear reactor. And the neutron monitors outside of the nuclear reactor were reading very high levels of neutrons. Well, what that means is that there was no water to moderate the neutrons. Even if the reaction was shut down, there were still more neutrons than they had ever experienced outside the core. And that's an indication that the core had lost its water and was, um, and was uncovered. Again, around 10 o'clock, the, um, the radiation monitors in the dome of the containment were at lethal levels, thousands of R an hour. Again, an indication that fuel is breaking down. So you had indications of zerk water reaction from the temperature. You had indications of fuel breaking down from these radiation levels. Um, someone took a reactor coolant sample. In other words, they went down to a line and they opened a little spigot and filled a, a vial. And normally those vials are very non-radioactive. This was reading 200 R an hour. That's uh, lethal in two hours. That's an incredible amount. Another indication of, of fuel failure. And around 10 o'clock in the morning, health physics asked the plant management to evacuate the auxiliary building. So all these things were happening, and yet the state wasn't told that things were really out of control. Um, the plant manager at the time, manager at the time was a guy named Miller, and here's what he had to say over the next couple of years about what was going on in that time frame. They were hot enough that they scared you. And he was talking about the in-core temperature. Well, if you're scared, one would think that an evacuation might be in order. Um, pretty early, we were scared. Radiation was all over the place. Everything was off scale. Another indication, if you're scared, it's about time to at least tell the civilians that it's time to, time to move out. I should note that everything I've got up here is substantiated with footnotes in a report which will be up on TMIA's website. Uh, literally every one of these quotes is referenced back to uh, a, a, a reference document. And the same with the temperatures earlier. This was... Uh, uh, another interesting quote, we don't know where the hell the plant was going. Now, Miller said that in a phone call to Parsippany, Parsippany was the headquarters office, at 7.30 in the morning. Uh, I, he, had the, he had the sense to tape the call, and I had a chance to read the transcript. And it was pretty clear in my mind that Miller was suggesting we should go to a general emergency, and the people in Parsippany talked him down to a site emergency. Um, and this was one of the quotes from, from his call to Parsippany. So Parsippany backed Miller down at 7.30, but I think until 7.30 his heart was in the right place and I think he was suggesting that uh, it's time to order an evacuation. After that, um, he changed his tune. But at 7.30 in the morning I think his heart was in the right place. And finally, we were not in our minds convinced that the Corps was totally covered. That's another indication that it's time to, to let the civilians know to, to head for the hills. And it didn't happen. Okay, last time where I think anybody of conscience would have uh, ordered an evacuation is before 2 o'clock in the, in, the, uh, in the afternoon. Um, based on the core temperature, we've been over this, there's clearly hydrogen was being generated. It, it could not have not been happening. There's a good double negative. Um, this is... Uh, an important piece, the next two. At, two, at 1220, the NRC asked TMI, what is the temperature in the core? Um, TMI got back to them shortly thereafter, and they said, we don't know. The computer is printing question marks. And then they said, that means the computer is messed up. In fact, question marks meant that the temperature in the core was over 700 degrees. It, they didn't know how high, but it knew it was high.